to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ but earnestly desired the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. Welcome to our study of 1 Corinthians 13 and 14 as we look at God's teaching about miracles. Friends, we live in a day and age when there is mass confusion about miracles. So many people have put the emotional appeal and the idea of miracles above all other doctrinal teachings. But Paul begins this discussion on miracles by showing us there's a more excellent way. Rather than desiring miracles, Christians ought to try and obtain real godlike love in our life. Notice again, he says the more excellent way, 1 Corinthians 13, we learn that way is love. Love is the greatest gift of all. Think about what God gave because of his love. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, John 3, verse 16. And the love we ought to have to show our respect for God's love, we ought to also have real love for him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, verse 15. The Bible teaches that, that love is that bond that holds Christians together. Let brotherly love continue, Hebrews 13, verse 1. And Jesus taught us in John 13, verses 34 and 35, that the whole world would know we're his disciples by the love we have for one another. And do you remember when that lawyer came to Jesus? He wanted to come and ask Jesus a question. Good teacher, what is the greatest of all commandments? And Jesus responded in Mark 12, verse 30 following by saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and the greatest of all commandments. And so true love is what we ought to be actively pursuing and trying to seek rather than Mirac miraculous knowledge and things of that nature. Now, what is, what is true love? What do we mean by that? Well, let's note first what true love is not. True love is not just having certain talents or abilities. That's not what love is. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, Paul is going to show us some things that even if we have these great gifts and we don't have love, it's worthless. For example, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Paul clearly states that eloquence, having the great ability of speech without love, is worthless. Notice verse 1. Paul says this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, notice what he says, I've become as sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Paul says, if I could speak with the tongues of angels, if I could give the greatest sermon you ever heard, but I didn't have love as the motivating factor, it would be like banging two pieces of metal together. It'd be worthless. My friends, we must have love as the motivation in everything we do. Paul taught us in Ephesians 4 verse 15, we're to speak the truth in love. Now, notice verse 2. Now he says this, miraculous, having miracles without love. That's worthless also. Paul says this in verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Imagine you could prophesy, you had miraculous gifts of healing, you had miraculous faith, miraculous knowledge, and yet you didn't have love. You could do all those great, wonderful things, but you didn't have love. That would be worthless. And friend, remember love at its very core is being obedient to God. Now, notice verse 3 also says this, self-sacrifice. If I were to die, for the cause of Christ, and yet didn't have love, that also would be worthless. Paul says this in verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Here we learn that self-sacrifice without love is worthless. Let's say that you gave everything you own for the poor, 
and you didn't love God. That would be worthless. Let's say that you even died for Jesus and yet you didn't have real love in your heart. All of that would have been worthless. And so regardless of whether we have eloquence, whether we have miraculous power, whether we have or whether they had miraculous power, whether we have the ability to give all that we have for God, if we don't have love, None of that amounts to anything. Now someone says, well, what do you mean by love? What is real love? Well, Paul identifies love, real love, the qualities of it, in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. Here's what he says about love. Love is something that is suffering long. It suffers long with us. Love is kindness in action. Love is not jealousy or envy. It doesn't cause us to be envious or jealous of others. Love is not something that goes around parading itself saying, well, look at me. Look how good I am. It's not puffed up. It doesn't think it's better than everybody else. Love is not when someone, someone acts rudely. That's not what love is. Love is not about its own interest. It's about providing the interest of others. It doesn't get angry quickly. It's not something that rejoices in evil. Rather, love is rejoicing in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. That's what real love is. It's not a better felt than told kind of idea. Real love is based on one's actions and how we serve God. Now, in the midst of this section about love, Paul is now going to show us the scriptures clearly teach that all Bible miracles ended in the first century. Now that may come across a little strange and a little odd to a lot of people because there are so many who think today that we're living in the age of the miraculous still and there are people just like there were in the first century who can do miracles. Now I want you first to understand when we say there are no Bible miracles happening today. Here's what we're not saying. We're not saying God's dead. Friend, understand God is alive and well. He is reigning from heaven as He always has. God's not dead. God's still alive. We're not saying that, there is, uh, that, that prayer is useless. There's power in prayer. We believe the effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. We are not saying that God is not working in providence through natural means. We know that God is still working to accomplish His will. Well, someone says, well, what then are you saying when you say there are no miracles today? Here's what we mean. What is a Bible miracle? Well, here's what that is. Think about John chapter 11. Jesus' friend Lazarus dies. And in John chapter 11, Jesus goes to the place where he's buried and he proclaims, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man who had been dead for many days, so much so that he had a stench, arose as though he was still and rose and was alive again. That's a Bible miracle. A dead man who'd been dead for many days. Everybody knew it. Nobody, even the critics, could deny it. He arose. Well, think about the man in Acts chapter 3, the lame man who sat at the beautiful gate, who'd been there his life. Everybody knew him. Everybody saw him. He reaches out to Peter and John. Do you have any alms you can give me? Peter says, silver and gold we do not have, but what we have we give you in the name of Jesus, arise and walk. Now, friends, that was such a powerful miracle. Even the critics said in Acts chapter 4 and verse 5 that a notable miracle has been done. We cannot deny it. And so a, a real Bible miracle is something that is visible to all, even the critics can't deny. Think about John 9. Jesus made the blind man see. Everybody knew that man. He'd been blind from birth. Jesus said the words and that blind man saw again. Now here's how that's different from what we see in miracles today. Someone may... If someone claims, uses the word miracle to describe a healing today, it happens over a long period of time and people don't feel good right away. That's not a Bible miracle. A Bible miracle was immediate. Jesus spoke the word and Jairus' daughter got well. Mark chapter 5, verse, uh, Mark chapter 5 and 6. Uh, a Bible miracle was undeniable. Even the critics had to say, yes, a miracle has been done and we can't deny it. And true miracles in the Bible were not for physical gratification. They weren't just to make people feel better. How do we know that? Think about 2 Timothy 4 verse 20. Paul said this, Trophimus I have left in Melita sick. Now did Paul have the power to work miracles? Absolutely. Unusual miracles, the Bible says, were worked by the hands of Paul. If Paul had the power to work miracles, why in the world did he leave Trophimus in Melita sick? 
Here's why. Because that miracle would not have promoted the purpose of miracles in the Bible. Why were miracles occurring in the Bible? What, what was the purpose of a miracle? Was it just to get somebody well? Was it to make somebody feel better? Not at all. Notice what the Bible says in Mark chapter 16 and verse 20. Here's the purpose of miracles in the New Testament. Scripture reads, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word, notice this, through the accompanying signs. God gave them the ability to do miracles so that people would know. That sign, it was a sign pointing to them as a spokesman from God. When someone performed a miracle, when they healed a lame man, what was that supposed to point to? Listen up. This person is a spokesperson, a spokesman of God. And so miracles in the Bible were to confirm the word spoken. Now, how do we know that miracles don't exist today? 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 through 10 teaches us that all miracles, all miracles like you read about in the Bible have ended. Notice what this text says. Paul says in verse 8, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge in the context, it's miraculous. Verse 2 and 3 teach that. Where there's knowledge, it will, the Bible says, vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Notice this though. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. Now friends, the Bible clearly says a time is coming when prophecy, tongue speaking, and miraculous knowledge would cease. When is that time? Well, verses 9 and 10 tell us when that which is perfect has come. Well, Jesus has already come. He's died by this time. The promise is one day he's going to come again, but he doesn't say come again here. He says when that which is perfect has come. Well, what is that perfect? The word perfect literally means complete. Here's where that word is used. In James 1 verse 25, the word, the same Greek word, teleos, is used to describe the scriptures. We have the perfect law of liberty. If the purpose of miracles was to confirm the word, and if God's word is spoken of toward the end of the New Testament as complete, then we can know this. When God's full and complete will, the New Testament, was given to mankind, the purpose of miracles was no longer needed. We can now confirm the word that people say speak by checking it according to the scriptures. Now, here's another way we can know that miracles ended in the first century. When the Bible was completed, their purpose ended and Acts chapter 8 verse 18, the Bible says, Simon realized that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the gift of miracles was given. Ask yourself this, when the last, if, the, if miracles were given by the laying on of the apostles' hands, what happened to that ability when the last apostle died? Friends, I think we can all clearly see by the end of the first century when the last apostle died, so did the ability to pass those miracles on. We are not living in the age of the miraculous today. People are not raising the dead. People are not healing lame people in an undeniable fashion. Oh, there are claims of it. There are hoaxers. Most of them will say this. Now that we've done this miracle, won't you send us a love offering? Here's what you don't see. You never see that in the Bible. When people perform miracles, they never ask for money. In fact, the one time someone tried to offer them money for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that man was told, you're going to go to hell for doing that. Acts chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. And so miracles have ceased. We don't live in that age anymore. Rather, we live in the age where love ought to be exalted above all else. Now, in chapter 14, Paul is now going to deal with the idea of tongue speaking and how that prophesying or preaching the Word of God, proclaiming the Word of God, ought to be desired much greater than tongue speaking. Notice 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1. The Bible here says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. The word prophesy means to bubble forth. It's the idea of proclaiming a message from God. We preach today, which would be similar to the prophesying in the sense that they were telling the message of God. Now that ought to be valued much greater than tongue speaking. Why? 
Romans 1 16 says it's the gospel that's God's power to save. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says the word of God is living and powerful. Jesus said heaven and earth would pass away. My word will never pass away. Matthew 24 verses 34 through 36. It is the word of God that causes us to be born again and it is the word of God by which we receive with meekness that we're saved. And so tongues cannot save anyone. They're not for building up in knowledge. They're for self-edification in the context of 1 Corinthians 14. But you know, there's so much confusion about what tongue speaking really was in the New Testament. Here's how it's interpreted today. Someone receives a, a gift from God, supposedly miracle workers do today, and they begin to talk in some gibberish, uh, what they call a Holy Spirit language, a language that only they and God know. Here's the problem with that. Every case in the Bible, tongue speaking, was actually speaking in a known language that people somewhere knew and yet you had never studied. Now, how do we know that's the case? Look at 1 Corinthians 14, verses 10 and 11. It clearly points out it is actually speaking a language. Paul says this, There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks to me shall be a foreigner. Paul is talking about in the context of tongue speaking that it is a language. It is a language that somebody somewhere knows. And if you're speaking an unknown language in the assembly and nobody knows that, what good is that going to do? And so Paul teaches us then that in the context where tongue speaking was occurring, there always had to be an interpreter. This is another distinction you see between what happened in the New Testament and what so many hoaxers are doing today. Oftentimes you'll watch and you'll see and somebody's up there speaking in tongues and nobody has a clue what they're saying. Well, that's contradictory to Bible teaching. The Bible says there always has to be an interpreter. Notice 1 Corinthians 14, verses 27 and 28. Paul says this in the context of 1 Corinthians 14. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three each in turn, and let one interpret. Now notice this. If there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the assembly, in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. It's clear from this teaching, if someone had the ability to speak in tongues and there was an interpreter there, he could control that and he was forbidden to do that. And yet so many times today, people act like they can't control that and they just have to do it regardless of whether there's interpreter there or not. And so to find ourselves in contradiction with the scripture in this teaching, we've got to make sure, or to make sure we don't find ourselves, we've got to make sure we do it according to the Bible. Now, here's another very important principle. Oftentimes when you watch supposed miracle workers on TV, many of those go into a complete what it looks like control by the Holy Spirit and as though they're having an out-of-body experience and they can't do anything to control that. It's just kind of happening to them. And we watch that and it's like, wow, that's just taken over their body. That's not what happened in the first century. You can know that's a trick, that's a joke, that's a hoax because in the first century, even when people receive gifts of the Holy Spirit, they had the ability to control that. How do we know that? Notice what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and I want you to look especially in verse 32. It's a very simple statement, but Paul says this in verse 32, and the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That is, when a prophet received a revelation, when someone received something by the miraculous, that person could control that. If someone else was up speaking, he wasn't to get up and do that. He wasn't to create confusion. Everything was to be done decently and in order. Chapter 14, verse 40 teaches us. And so this idea that you just kind of go into some Holy Spirit trance and He overtakes you and you're under complete control, that's not the way it was in the New Testament. Friends, that is someone trying to trick you, trying to get you on an emotional high, and that's not what you read about in the Bible. The Spirit of the prophet was subject to the prophet. What's that mean? He could control when he received a revelation, when someone received something from God by the Holy Spirit in the time of the miraculous, they could control it. And friend, be sure, God's not the author of confusion. He's not out trying to confuse people today by comparing what you, you don't have to look and say, well, I've got to compare what I see today with that in the first century. No, you don't. You've got to compare 
You've got to go to the Bible and realize that God is not trying to confuse people. The devil is. And many people today are who want to promote the use of miracles. But notice the words of 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. The Bible clearly teaches God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches. Friends, God from the beginning has clearly taught us what He wants us to know about the miraculous, how He wants us to live our life, and what we need to do to be pleasing to Him. Now, mixed in with this tongue speaking, with the prophesying, doing things decently and in order, we learn a very important teaching about the role of women. Let your women keep silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak. Paul says if they want to learn something, let them ask their husband at home. Let's say that a woman is there and she received a revelation. She received some kind of revelation from God. Was she to stand up in the middle of the assembly and spill that out? No, or speak that out. Not at all. In fact, the Bible says she's to keep silent, and if she wants to learn something in the assembly, maybe something that somebody said she's not sure about, she goes home and asks her husband. She doesn't raise her hand in the middle of the sermon and say, well, I don't quite understand that. We're to do things decently and in order, and in accord with 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12, a woman is not to preach or to be an authority over a man, but to remain in silence. Now, someone says, well, all these are are good ideas, all these are good teachings, these are things that we really need to know about, but are these the words of God that are binding on us today? Notice 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37. Paul says, if any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge, let him first acknowledge that the things which I write to you, these are the commandments of God. Friend, this is not just good advice. This is not Paul's opinion on the matter. The words that we've read, we've noticed from the Bible today are God's commandments for them and God's commandments just as much for us. Paul was an inspired man of God, and when we see people doing things that are in direct conflict with what Paul said about miracles here, then we know this. Paul was inspired. What he said was of God. Those people are teaching error. They're not holding to God's doctrine, and they're leading people astray. And so to clear up all this confusion, what do we do? We go to the Bible. We see what God has said on the matter. We don't let ourselves be led by emotion. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 16, verse 25. We don't do what our family has always done, no matter how good it makes us feel down inside. Rather, we do what the Bible says so that we can do, as verse 40 will say, all things decently and in order. Now, I want you to ask yourself this. When you watch these supposed miracle workers who stand up and they have this big showing and, and they're throwing people down or they're causing people to fall down on the stage, everybody's in a frenzy, the camera pans to the audience and people are wailing and, and flopping around in the audience, does that look decently and in order? My friend, I think all of us would say, no, it actually looks like chaos and confusion. Remember, God's not the author of confusion, verse 33 says, and we're to do all things decently and in order. I can guarantee you this. If someone had a miraculous gift in the first century in the assembly, they waited their turn, they did it decently where it would not cause confusion, and they held to a proper order in doing things. There was structure. It was done for the edifying of all. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7 teaches, and it is so different than what we see today. Now, remember all this teaching about miracles. In the midst of it, there's a greater way, and that way is the way of love. Friend, rather than we focus on miracles today, let's focus on the love of God and what that means for our life. I guarantee you, having the love of God, pursuing that, will get you a lot further than pursuing teachings about miracles. Because if I love God, if I understand what God's love is, God so loved the world He gave His only begotten Son, John 3, verse 16. If I understand that while we were without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly, if I understand that when Jesus went up on the cross and He hung there and He bore my sins in His own body, that's what real love is, then my friends, that's going to motivate me to focus my life on serving God and loving Him. How we need today to be dedicated to pursuing a life that lives every day for Jesus Christ. Paul said this in Galatians 2 verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, 
but Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said we are to be living sacrifices for Jesus, Romans 12 and verse 1. And so rather than trying to grab a hold of this emotional frenzy about miracles, Let's look at the love of God and let's respond to that in love by keeping His commandments, John 14, verse 15, and by giving our whole life to Him. Friend, maybe you've never accepted God's love in your life. Maybe you've never become a child of God. What does the New Testament teach you've got to do to become a Christian? Friend, this is a subject that the Bible is so clear about. First, you must be willing to recognize the Bible is God's final authority. You've got to hear and listen to the Word of God and that only. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Once I've gone to the Word of God, I've realized it's the only authority. I've read the message. I understand its words. Then I must be willing to believe in Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, as Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling down the road, uh, he comes to a certain place of water. He's evidently been teaching about baptism. He says, hey, here's water. You've been talking about Christ and how to become a Christian. What do you want me to do? He said, if. If you believe with all your heart, you may. You must believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior, the only way to be saved. Having believed in Jesus, the Scriptures teach, we've got to be willing to change our life. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Repentance is a changed will that leads to a changed way. It's a 180 degree turn in one's life from sin to God. Then having repented, I must be willing to confess the name of Jesus. Romans 10 verse 10 says, with the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And yes, friend, I must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. There are so many passages that emphasize this clear point. Jesus said, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3 verses 3 through 5. Peter said in 1 Peter 3 verse 21, baptism does now also, not alone, combined with hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, baptism is essential to salvation. At what point did Paul, Saul, have his sins washed away? Acts 22, 16, Saul was told, you need to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, have you obeyed God's plan of salvation or has someone led you down a trail involving an emotional frenzy about miracles where you've pretty much not focused on anything else? Remember, loving God and serving Him is the greater way. Focus your life and your attention on how to please God. And friend, I can guarantee you, you'll have the best life you could ever imagine by dedicating it to the service of the Lord. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.